So, hello everyone, welcome. Before we start, I wanted to share a few words and welcome Daniel to Kush again, to Zion. And thank you so much for coming tonight and giving this talk. Having venerable children uh, needs no introduction, really, but I've had personally the good fortune of knowing her for a number of years um, at the center where I was previously, and then I've been on retreat at Shavasti Abbey, the abbey that she founded in 2003, and then joined them to do winter retreat as well. Um, Shavasti Abbey is in Washington State in the US, and it's a really inspiring uh, monastic community that organizes also retreat for monastics and lay people and has a community of 16 now yeah. mm -hmm. and offers wonderful training for monks and nuns and um, and is really growing I was just really amazed it's like in the space of you know what is it 15 years mm -hmm. You know, when they first moved there, it was kind of like a log cabin, really. And you moved there with two cats. You and two cats. And in the space of 15 years, now there's a, a wonderful house for lay women, for nuns, and a beautiful hall for dining, Chenrezig Hall with a little temple. And... Um, and a, a house for you. And then they've also started thinking about their next building project, which be to build a large Buddha hall. So it's really inspiring. And um, Venerable Children, you would think that that's a full-time job. And it is, really. And uh, somehow she finds the time to um, edit and write these amazing books and so of course she's a you know as you sure you read a number of her books best-selling authors of a number of different books and the talk tonight specifically I was really uh, interested in giving Venable Children the opportunity to talk about this wonderful series that she's editing uh, with His Holiness and His Holiness the Dalai Lama actually asked her to be a co-author, not merely an editor. And it's a series that I think is, you know, somewhat less well known in the UK. So I'm really glad that we can talk about it tonight. And so it's, it's published by um, Wisdom Publication and they've labeled it the Library of Wisdom uh, and Compassion. And three volumes have already come out. This is the first volume. And of course, Venerable Honu at the back, who's taking care of the bookstore. The volumes are in the bookstore outside. Uh, but this is volume one and volume four. This is volume two. Oh, no, that's volume one. Time. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, no, that's all right. Uh, and then volume four is coming out in a, in a month. In October 15th. In two weeks. Yes. Yeah, that's exciting. And so, um, and this is a real gift to us all Dharma practitioners, because this is, anyways, Venerable, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. And then also, you'll see close to the books, there's a little bit of information on Shavasti Abbey. It's a really inspiring project and community. And so, you know, I encourage everyone to, you know, have a look at it and investigate. It's, you know, Venerable Children and Shavasti Abbey community does um, amazing work supporting uh, monastics in the West uh, to receive education and to learn the Vinaya and to live in the vows. And, you know, I'm very inspired by that. I'm very grateful. Anyway, mm. so. So um, I don't know who she's talking about. <laughs> Yeah, these introductions always embarrass me.
Yeah, so we're going to read the prayers for teaching occasions on page five. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Zigata, know of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shaki clan, I prostrate, make offerings and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, know of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shaka clan, I prostrate, make offerings and go for refuge, to the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sigata, know of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shaki clan, I prostrate, make offerings and go for refuge. Where no supreme amongst humans who were born on this earth, he paced out seven strides and said, I am supreme in this world, to you who are wise then, I prostrate. With pure bodies, form supremely pure, Wisdom is shown like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, winner of the best, Lord, to you I prostrate. With the supreme signs, face like spotless moon, colour like gold, to you I prostrate. Dust free like you, the three worlds are not, incomparably wise one, to you I prostrate. The saver having great compassion, the founder having all understanding, the field of merit with qualities like a vast ocean, to you the one gone to thusness, I prostrate. The purity that frees one from attachments, the virtue that frees one from the lower realms, the one path, sublime pure reality, to the Dharma that pacifies, I prostrate. Those who are liberated and who also show the path to liberation, the holy field qualified with realizations, who are devoted to the moral precepts, to you the sublime community intending virtue, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bound with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions, prefer for many virtuous actions, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a mirage, a flame, a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew, a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud, see condition things as such. Through these merits may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the foe of faults, and be delivered from samsara's ocean, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. So um, we do a short mandala offering on page, I think it's 16 at the bottom, in Tibetan. Sashi Purki Jushing me to Trahari Rabbling Ji Nihide Gem Pari
Okay, good. Thank you for the welcome, everybody. Um, so tonight's topic was, is uh, Buddhism in the 21st century. And to tell you the truth, I really don't feel like talking about that. <laughs> because, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, uh, no, it's Buddhism in the future. That's what it is. And as His Holiness Dalai Lama says, you never know the future until it happens. So, for me to talk about the future... So she just gave me a lead-in to something I do want to talk about, <laughs> which is um, the series. And I think what I'll do is pick out something in here to read and comment on, so you'll get an idea. This is much more interesting. Could you go up to my room and get my glasses? I am, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I always like to start with a little bit of meditation <clears throat> before we have the talk. So if you want to sit up straight. And just check in with your body for a minute, see if there's tension. Anywhere, and if there's tension, then release that. Then turn your attention to the breath, observing it either from the point of your abdomen, watching the breath as it goes in and out, or from the point of view of your upper lip and nostrils, there observing the sensation of the breath as it passes. <clears throat> so put your focus at one of those two points and keep it there. And just observe your breath, what it feels like to inhale, to exhale, and observe how the breath is changing in every moment. It doesn't remain the same at all, constantly in flux. So let's do that for a few minutes and in that way, let our mind settle down. If you get distracted, just realize the distraction and then come back home to the breath. So we'll do that.
let's set our motivation. And since our motivation <coughs> is the most important part of whatever action we do, let's make sure that we transform whatever motivation we start out with into one that is imbued with compassion. So compassion is not pity. It's simply a wish for living beings to be free of suffering and its causes. And all unsatisfactory conditions and their causes as well. So whether we know different sentient beings or not, that we share some very common qualities that help us really understand what's in everyone's heart. And that is that everybody wants happiness and no one wants suffering. And so with that in mind, knowing that that's the most important thing to ourselves and to all other living beings, then let's cultivate the intention to, as much as we can, bring about that happiness and eliminate suffering. And in that way, make a positive contribution to society and a positive contribution to each and every living being in the sense that in the long run, we want to be able to lead them to their, the development of their full spiritual potential so that they can become fully awakened Buddhas. So let's generate that motivation so that we're all here for a common reason with a common intention. So, I'm going to tell you the story about the Library of Wisdom and Compassion. It, um, it comes from my having uh, studied Tibetan Buddhism for many, many years, um, being part of like the first wave of uh, Westerners that came and encountered the Tibetan Lamas when uh, there weren't lots of Buddhist books available in English. There was basically Lobsang Rampa, yeah, who was, as I understand it, an Irish plumber who made up these fantastic stories of Tibet and all the magic going on there. So that was kind of that, and Anagarika Govinda and Alexandra David Neal was about it when I came along. And slowly there came to be more books. Yeah. And we received teachings, you know, the, the first group that came along 
Um, many of our teachers did not speak English, so we heard teachings in Tibetan with a translator. And of those that did speak English, um, we had to readjust our way of understanding English. <laughs> yeah. But we were completely uh, astounded at what the lamas were saying, and also at the, the way they lived and their, their kindness, their, their obvious compassion towards others. But it wasn't easy. Yeah, it wasn't easy at all. There weren't facilities. I can go on and tell you all sorts of stories about the early days, you know, where we studied uh, in this tent in outside of Kathmandu um, at Kopan Monastery. So it was us and the fleas. Yeah, these wonderful little sentient beings that we were told were the key to our awakening and to develop compassion for them, include, you know, including all other living beings, but all the little fleas that crawled around us as we tried to listen to the teachings. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was interesting because uh, the teachings we heard were from the standard Tibetan texts that were basically authored for Tibetans who were already Buddhists, okay? And so one of the, these texts was called the Lamrim, which is still the basic kind of study program in most Dharma centers. Lamrim means stages of the path. So it includes all the different uh, stages to meditate on to reach full awakening. It was designed for Tibetan monastics who had done years and years of philosophical studies, who were about to go into retreat and show them the important points of Buddha's teachings to meditate on. That was who the audience for these texts was. Well, the group of Westerners who came along, we weren't the suitable audience. But we got the teachings anyway. And we were, you know, a group of people that kind of staggered up the hill from what in those days was called Freak Street. I won't tell you what we did there. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, all these young people, most of us 20s, 30s, uh, came to sit at the feet of these to Tibetan lamas and listen to the teachings. And, you know, the Tibetans have a certain sense of humor that is often very different than our sense of humor. And so the lamas would read these texts and sometimes, you know, they, the, they would crack jokes. Sometimes in the, in the uh, stories, in the texts, there would, there would be, you know, supposed to be things that were funny. And, uh, the Tibetans would laugh, and we'd all sit there like this, like, what? Okay, you want to hear one of them? Okay, so there's two that are really the ones that get me. Anyway, here's one. So there was this man who... Uh, he bought a sack of barley, tsampa, that's what they ate in Tibet. And he brought it home and he tied it uh, to uh, his ceiling. Some of you are nodding, you know this story. And he tied the sack of tsampa to the ceiling, you know, so that the mice couldn't get it. But mice are smart. Anyway, he tied it to the ceiling. And then he started dreaming about, oh, you know, I'm going to go off and do this work, and then I'm going to get some more money, 
and when I get more money, then I'll be able to get married, and I'll have a nice life, and then when I marry this beautiful woman, we'll have a child, and what am I going to name the child? What am I going to name the child? And he thought and thought and thought, you know, about what to name a child. And then he came up with a name. And he loved that name. And he said, I'm going to name the child this. And he was so happy, he started dancing in his room. And he had a, a broomstick or a stick somewhere in his room. And he was dancing with the stick. And he hit the sack, stack, sack of barley and it fell on top of him and hurt him. And I can't remember what the point of that story was. <laughs> Do you remember? You were nodding your head. What was the point? Yeah. There's something about, you know, looking in the future yeah. and yeah. not being practical. Yeah, you know, projecting all your attachment in the future and it's, you know, and instead what happens is you injure yourself in the process of it. He dies? Oh, he died, poor guy. You know, then there was the other guy who was on top of a cliff and a wild mule was running by and he slipped and fell off the cliff and landed facing backwards on the back of the wild mule who was running down the, the plateau. Yeah, and this example was to show us how rare it was to have a precious human life. Because how often do you fall off a cliff and instead of getting injured, you land backwards on the back of a wild mule? Okay, so we had these marvelous teachings and these stories that, you know, we're trying to put together. <laughs> If any of you have ever studied um, Aryadeva's 400, he tells stories in that text that, again, you know, he's Indian. And we're like reading, and what are these about? Anyway, okay, so this was the ambience. We're, we're learning the Dharma in with the fleas and the wild mules and the bags of sampa that fall from the ceiling. And so what I realized in the process of this, you know, is that the Lamrim is precious and the teachings in, are in it are amazing, but they're suited for Tibetans who, you know, understand the culture and everything. And it, it you know, it was difficult for us to understand also because the topics assumed that you understood what mind is, what rebirth was, that you were convinced in rebirth. The, the book assumed that you believed in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And we were all, you know, kind of, you know. <laughs> Hi, Lama. Lama, what do you think about getting stoned and meditating? Yeah? Mama, have you ever dropped acid? Do you think it's good to meditate on acid? I mean, look at the, the difference in audience. <laughs> okay. Lama handled it all very beautifully, especially when we asked him the questions about intoxicants. He looked at us and he said, you're already hallucinating, dear. You don't need to take drugs. <laughs> and he was referring to 
you know, our ignorant mind that hallucinates and makes things up. But we think that things exist the way we see them. So having studied like this, you know, and really worked to try and understand not just the jargon in the long run, but really the meaning. After uh, some time, I thought, gee, you know, it would be really helpful to have uh, a book on the stages of the path written for people who didn't grow up as Tibetan Buddhists that started out with topics that we need to hear so that we could really figure out what the teachings were all about and check them out. So I went to ask His Holiness one time. It must have been maybe 74, no, 94, 95. And I, I asked him, can, you know, please could you write a short text that the Tibetan lamas can use when they're teaching Westerners that would contain the points that in the order that were suitable for Westerners. Because His Holiness was very familiar with the Western mind and Western culture. And uh, what he turned around and did and said, okay, but first we have to write a longer text. And then he gave me a transcript of something that, a teaching that he gave, and sent me away and said, okay, write something longer. So I started writing, and it's very difficult to get appointments with His Holiness. Yeah, you have to wait for some time. So I'm writing, and I'm using notes from the teachings that I had heard from him. I collected a lot of questions from my Dharma friends, questions that we all had uh, that weren't answered in the typical text. And finally, after some years, I was able to have an appointment, and I asked His Holiness these questions and recorded the answers and edited it. And, and then he kind of sent me away to keep working on this. And so this happened a few times. And then during one of the interviews, he said, uh, you know, this book has to be different than all the other Lam Rim books. Uh, it should include things about the, the other uh, Buddhist traditions. And because typically Tibetan texts don't talk about the other traditions. So, uh, so then I went to Thailand and I spent uh, a couple of weeks in a Thai monastery receiving teachings, and it was a very interesting experience because the, the women uh, in Thailand cannot become nuns. They're called Mai Chi. They only have five or eight precepts. And uh, by that time, I was already a bhikshuni, fully ordained. So the monks didn't know what to do with me, you know, because they couldn't put me with the monks because the nuns are lower. And they couldn't put me with the lay people because the Sangha was higher. So the Sangha would sit here, and the lay people would sit here, and they put me right in the middle. <laughs> I was all alone looking this way and looking that way. Anyway, we managed it very well. And uh, I learned a lot. And then I also have a, a quite strong connection with Chinese Buddhism. Uh, and so I learned much more about Chinese Buddhism and read. And, you know, one of my teachers is, uh, my Vinaya teacher is Chinese. So, uh, you know, so then I came back and I started re writing more. And then, you know, I finally got another appointment. and. Uh, His Holiness says, well, you know, how's the manuscript going? And I said, fine, it's about 2,000 pages. <laughs> and he said, well, we need to check it. And then he started reading it, and, uh, you know, we got through maybe three or four pages in a couple of hours. <laughs> and then when I told his 
the people in his office that His Holiness wants to read and check the whole thing. They just said, impossible, impossible. So what His Holiness then did was he appointed one, uh, one Geshe to come and assist me to read through everything and, you know, check the content. So uh, we did that. We worked on that for a number of years. And then, you know, finally, after another, you know, years are going by, because this all started out in like 94, 95. And finally, I got much clearer instructions. And so the first book that we published, which was not part of this, the Library of Wisdom and, and Compassion, was the book Buddhism, One Teacher, Many Traditions. And it uh, talks about the different Buddhist traditions from the viewpoint of doctrine. It's not like most of the books talking about multiple Buddhist traditions are actually quite superficial. Yeah, they all have altars, the people bow, they make offerings. But ours, the book we did, was really about the teachings. And so that came out in, I think, 2014. So it was like almost 20 years from the first time I went there. And then after that started to write the Library of Wisdom and Compassion. I still don't know how many volumes it's going to be. My guess is nine or ten. So the first uh, volume is Approaching the Buddhist Path. So this is an introductory volume. It talks about the mind. It talks about rebirth. It answers a lot of the questions and gives a lot of the background that people who are not Tibetan Buddhists need before learning the path. So we put that in this vo the first volume and also half of the second volume. <coughs> the second volume is called The Foundation of Buddhist Practice. So the first half of that is, again, introductory material, which it, you say introductory, it sounds like it should be easy material. It's not. If you've been to any of His Holiness's teachings in the West, he dives right in at the beginning talking about philosophy. Yeah, he doesn't start with, yes, be kind and nice to people. But, you know, his way of teaching is, He'll teach something that everybody can understand, and then he'll go immediately into some deep philosophy. Then he'll pull back and again, something everybody can understand. And then again, you know, very interesting, you know? And he doesn't, uh, he'll give you the basic points, but he doesn't necessarily uh, care if you understand everything. Because the way they teach the Dharma in Tibetan Buddhism, it's very much regarded as you're planting seeds on people's mind. So they give you the teaching with the idea that you're going to have the teaching, you're going to hear it many, many times. And so each time you hear it, you understand something deeper, you understand it in, in a, a, a richer way. But you're not expected to understand the whole thing. So it's not like in Western education where we, uh, you know, learn something and then we tell the professor what they already know in, on an exam and get a piece of paper as a present afterwards. Uh, you know, here it's really something that you're supposed to hear many times, think about on your own, discuss with other people, contemplate it. You know, there's really, uh, uh, the students have to exert effort. Yeah, they don't spoon feed you. Uh, so, so then in the second volume, after the rest of the introductory material, um, we started with the long rim. Now, I initially thought, those of you who are familiar with the teachings, one of the first teachings you hear is about how to rely on a spiritual master. And I thought, 
I'm going to put that at the end because, you know, it's a difficult topic to understand. And people who are just coming to Buddhism, all the details are not so important. But then as I watched Buddhism unfold in the West, I realized how confusing this topic was for Westerners and how easy it was for people to not understand what the purpose of a spiritual mentor is and how to relate to one properly because there started to be various scandals and so on in Buddhist groups. So I thought, no, we got to put this chap, you know, this at the beginning. So I did start with it. And of so much in the, in those two chapters about the relationship with the spiritual mentor are from His Holiness directly. So there's some of the general material that you always hear and His Holiness's personal advice about how to understand it and how to, to navigate. Yeah. The, the relationship and His Holiness is so unique in this way and so clear and so practical. Um, yeah, so I, I really recommend those two chapters. And then from there, we got a little bit into precious human life, more about rebirth, you know, because people need to hear it again, how rebirth works, the different realms and so on. Um, in the Tibetan Lamrim, they talk a lot about the lower realms. You know, just what you want to hear, you know, is like the de detailed descriptions of the eight cold hells and the eight hot hells and, you know, the various preta realms and everything. Just, just, you know, something that's really going to motivate us, you know. But hey, we're coming by and large from religions that had their own hell realms. Yeah, that most of us just, you know, it wasn't a motivating factor. In fact, if it motivated us, it was to turn away from our old religion. OK, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, His Holiness doesn't speak a lot about the hell realms. You know, if he's giving a transmission, he'll mention them, but he won't. He'll just do the reading, the transmission, but he won't talk very much about them. So I followed that. So it's safe. You can read it. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, you'll have to read the, the, the other books written by, you know, um, I think Pabonka Rinpoche, he, he gets really, he loves talking about the hell realms. Um, okay. His Holiness is not big on that. Then we talked about death. And not only preparing for our death, but how to help other people die. And then usually after that is the topic about the different realms. So we went through that simply, you know. And then after that, they usually talk about refuge. But what I and some of my other friends who are teaching in the West have found is that Westerners don't understand refuge when you bring it in that early. You know, when you talk about the Buddha's qualities and he's omniscient and he can manifest many bodies. And, you know, most Westerners are like, really like, you know, we, we can't have faith so easily. Yeah. And the, the idea in the general Lamrim for putting refuge there, was that people would generate faith so that the next topic, which was on karma and its effects, then they would believe in karma and its effects because they had faith in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. But that didn't work for Westerners, you know, because most of the people I talk to, it's like, I can't relate and I don't really understand it, but I want to hear about karma. You know, and so people want, yeah, they want to hear about karma. What do I practice? What do I abandon? What does karma mean? How does it work? Do I create it as an individual? Do we create it as groups? Can it be purified if it's negative? Can it be 
uh, destroyed if it's positive? You know, what, how, does, how in the world does karma work? And so what I decided to do was put the chapter on karma next, okay? Because that's what people wanted to hear and what they can relate to. And it's very practical. Um, I think the, the whole issue of karma and ethical conduct, the way to say it in, in conventional language is we've got to get our act together. Yeah? Or another way is stop acting like a jerk. Uh, because when we look at our most jerk-like actions, yeah, and may I say that the president of my country is an exemplar in illustrating the, uh, the ten non-virtues. Yeah. Exemplar. Perfect. Exact. He, you know, you can't beat him. Really. You know, outrageous statements, harsh words, lying, divisive speech, stealing, not paying people, you know, sexual misconduct. I mean, this guy's a champion. So, you know, so we can all relate to the importance of developing ethical conduct if it means stop being a jerk. Because who wants to be like that guy? Yeah. I won't comment on the British <laughs> Prime Minister. But I hear that there's some resemblance, you know, besides their hair. Um, yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll just stick to my president. You can have your Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> so there was a very cute cartoon in, um, in the American press after your Prime Minister got elected of him going to see the Queen and the Queen is offering him a comb and some hairspray. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so we moved the topic of karma up. So that's volume two. Volume three is then really going into the four truths. Yeah? Our current situation, the cause of it, you know, is there a state beyond it and the path to that state? It's often called the Four Noble Truths. But that translation is not so good because what's so noble about the first one? Okay. Actually, their noble refers to the Arya beings, the beings who see reality directly. And it's the four things that they see as true. So it's the four truths for the Aryas, or the four truths for the noble practitioners. But then they made it in English into the four noble truths, and we scratch our heads saying, what's noble about suffering? Also, the word suffering, horrible translation. Okay, it doesn't fit at all. The Tibetan or the um, Sanskrit and Pali word is dukkha, and it means unsatisfactory conditions. So I think we can all relate to we have unsatisfactory conditions in our life, right? Yeah? If you didn't have unsatisfactory conditions, you would not have come to this talk. You would be out doing something else. Okay? So it's not like we're in, you know, manifest suffering all the time. When you translate it as the truth of suffering, then again, people in our culture wonder, what out in the world are you talking about? First of all, you're saying suffering is noble, and then you're saying that life is suffering, but hey, I'm having a good time. At least sometimes, you know? So what's all this stuff? Why are you saying that life is suffering? 
So, you know, that's part of a translation problem. Okay. So maybe if I'm going to talk about Buddhism in the future, one thing we should really work on is having good translations. Yeah. Accurate translations. Terms that, you know, really reflect the meaning as much as possible. And when we, we don't have the right English word, which often we don't. Yeah. Then that we learn the, uh, the Pali or the Sanskrit word for it. Yeah. Because if we try and take the English word and apply it, because it's somewhat similar to a, to the meaning of uh, a Buddhist word, but it's not exact, then we get really confused. Okay? Let, you want to hear some examples? One word that my, one of my teachers uses a lot, and this is because he learned English by memorizing a, 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 di a dictionary. You know, that, a dictionary that was available maybe in the 1960s. So one of the words he uses is heresy. Now, what do you think about that? You know, people telling you that if you uh, have what, what I usually translate it as wrong views or distorted views, you know, okay, wrong views, distorted views, I'm not seeing things correctly. That I can accept. But to say that that's heresy and I'm a heretic, You know, that's Trump language, to exaggerate the thing, <laughs> okay? So, you know, so we need to, to really work on getting better translations. Another word that is very difficult is the word faith. You know, we translate one to, uh, Buddhist word as faith. What do we think about in the West? Blind faith, yeah? Who wants to have blind faith? Anybody here? I don't think so. Okay. What the word really means, and here I can't come up with a really good word, but it means something between confidence in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha and trust in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. It does not mean blind faith at all because Buddhism does not advocate blind faith. Yeah. So it's developing confidence in the teachings by learning them, studying them, yeah. then admiring the people who practice, aspiring to be like the people who practice. Okay, so we develop trust, we develop confidence. Blind faith, no. Okay, so, you know, these kinds of things, trying to think of better words, or at least uh, when I was writing the book, sometimes using faith, sometimes confidence, sometimes trust, so that it gives people a broader understanding of, of what the Buddha is really talking about. So, volume three was about uh, the, four, the four truths, okay? The last two truths, as you know, are true cessations and true paths. So, true cessations, the cessation of undesirable conditions and their causes, and true paths, the consciousnesses that we need to develop in, within ourselves that will liberate us from all of our wrong views and all of our mental afflictions and disturbing emotions. Okay, so those two, uh, we talked about the four truths in volume three, but the last two truths just happen to be the Dharma refuge. So at the beginning of volume four, that's when we put the whole explanation about refuge, <clears throat> because it was amplifying true paths and true cessations from volume three. 
And so again, talking about this, I uh, brought in about the the view from the Pali tradition, how they see the the three objects of refuge, material from uh, Gyulama Uttara Tantra, because His Holiness was also very clear. In this book, he wanted some of the material from the uh, philosophical text to be included so that people really got a deeper understanding of, uh, you know, what was going on. So chapter four started with refuge. And then since the three higher trainings, higher training and ethical conduct, concentration and wisdom were part of the true paths, then the rest of the text was talking about the three higher wis uh, the three higher trainings. So a beautiful chapter again, ethical discipline. Then a chapter on concentration, and that chapter that actually it's many chapters about concentration. And so there uh, we have the Pali traditions viewpoint. We have the Tibetan traditions viewpoint and also the Chinese traditions. So it's, it's very inclusive. And what I've found personally is that having studied in one of these traditions for many, many years, then reading the teachings, learning the teachings from the Theravada and the Chinese traditions really helped me understand the teachings in my own tradition and really help my own practice. So there's a whole big section in volume four on the four establishments of mindfulness. So that, let me go back and tell you a little story about how that part got written. So in the course of these interviews uh, with His Holiness over the years, during one of them, uh, you know, because I have Theravada friends and they're all meditating on the four establishments of mindfulness and I and also I saw through my studies in the Tibetan tradition that they're mentioned but they're not explained in great depth so I asked his holiness about this and he said he would really like if more people in the Tibetan tradition practice the four establishments of mindfulness and if they were taught in more depth and then he had his attendant pull out a text from the Tibetan tradition about the four establishments of mindfulness. And so he, we went through that text and it's beautiful, you know, beautiful explanation. And His Holiness was also saying at that time, because these kinds of teachings are found in the uh, Pali suttas, which talk you know, which often are quoted, you know, <clears throat> uh, from the Buddha. And His Holiness was saying how much he likes those suttas because he really gets the feeling of the Buddha as a human being living in this world, dealing with people. Yeah? Whereas in the Mahayana Sutras, the Buddha's in a pure land and there's light radiating everywhere and bodhisattvas arriving, you know, by, by however bodhisattvas arrive, it's not by the tube. And, you know, and things are emanating here and going there. And th these other, you know, the, vehicle, the sutras from the fundamental vehicle, it's, you know, the Buddha wakes up in the morning, and he, you know, does his meditation, and then he goes in for Pindapot to collect alms. And on the way, sometimes he'll, he'll uh, bump into people and have a Dharma discussion. He'll go and talk to some of the other wandering mendicants, mendic mendicants, you know, and ask them what they were talking about and how they meditate. Once in a while, you have a sutra where He's calling one of his own disciples to him, and he says, is it true, Bhikkhu, that you've been saying this or doing this? Yeah, his, Buddha's very good. You, I really learned a lot. Bef 
before you ever accuse anybody of doing anything, ask them if it's true what you heard that they were doing this. Yeah? So the Buddha would do this, and then the monk would say, yes, you know, I was saying that. And then the Buddha would go, foolish monk, have you ever heard me say that? You know, don't you think about things properly? Why are you distorting the teachings? I mean, sometimes he'll give people a good scolding, okay, but they need it. So the Buddha, you know, his holiness is saying he really likes those kind of sutras. Anyway, so that's how we got this big section about the, the uh, four establishments of mindfulness in the book. Then volume five, the, uh, yeah, so volume four is coming out middle of this month. Volume five is, uh, I've completed the draft and it's been edited and it's on the verge of going back to the publishers. And its title is In Praise of Great Compassion. And if you don't read any other volume, read this one. But read all of the other ones. <laughs> you know, uh, and this one, it's just, it's beautiful, you know, because it, it talks about love, it first starts out about the four immeasurables, love, compassion, joy, equanimity how they're practiced in the Pali tradition, how they're practiced in the Tibetan tradition, and then different teachers' presentations of how to develop uh, compassion, how to generate bodhicitta. It's a wonderful volume, okay? So that'll be volume five. Volume six, uh, still working on. That one is gonna be about the six perfections, or the, actually it's 10 perfections and also the, uh, the paths and stages, yeah, grounds and stages of the path. And then with volume seven, we're gonna dive into emptiness, the nature of reality. And that will take at least two volumes, maybe three, I'm not sure. And then after that, Tantra, which will be one volume, maybe two, but I doubt it. Okay, so that's, that's the whole overview of, of how uh, it's planned. And my hope is that this series will really be a resource for people to use in Dharma centers and to, ha to use as a curriculum uh, to teach people the Dharma. Because it's not the short Lam Rim books that are one volume. It's not the philosophical treatises translated into English where one sentence is this long, because that's if you translate from Tibetan, often what happens. But it's something that's written in much simpler, easier to understand English, uh, with some of His Holiness's stories in it. Yeah. Uh, that people can can more readily understand and that can really uh, prepare them for deeper studies. Okay, so what I thought, do you, do you want me to talk about Buddhism in the future? Is that why you came? <laughs> yeah? Uh, okay. We'll change the topic. Sorry to disappoint you. Tomorrow night I'm, I'm going to be at the, um, at the British Library, and their topic was uh, Buddhism in the 21st century. So there I'll talk a little bit about it. Or was that your title? <laughs> That's their title, okay. Okay. So... I just opened the book randomly, and the page says, can the Dharma change? You ever wondered about that? Bringing Buddhism to the West? Can the teachings change? Yeah, people often ask that. You know, 
when you visualize the Buddha, you know, can, can he be wearing different clothes? Can he look different? Yeah, when we visualize, uh, you know, Chenresi, the Buddha of compassion, can, can, you know, can we change what he looks like? Okay. What about the teachings? You know, all this stuff on the hell realm and hungry ghost realm and, you know, is that really true? Do we really have to go in depth about that? Okay, so let me read what uh, His Holiness says. I think this part's interesting. And it relates to Buddhism in the future. Some people ask if the Buddha's teachings can be changed in order to make them more relevant to our historical period. While they want to make the Dharma more understandable to others, they are concerned that altering the teachings would impact their authenticity and efficacy. This question requires much careful thought. In other words, what can change and what can't change? Yeah? When, when we come here and, you know, this is the mandala, uh, yeah, Mount Meru, it's Mount Meru, and the four continents, the ancient Indian version of the universe. Yeah? Are, are we supposed to take that literally? Yeah? And, and all this stuff, you know, brocade, katas. Westerners love katas. Yeah, at the Abbey, they love katas, even though they're very perplexed about what to do with them. Yeah, but do we need katas in the West? Do we need katas? In India, they, they use flower garlands. In Tibet, they made katas because they didn't have so many flowers. You know, maybe in the West we have strings of popcorn or something. <laughs> but, you know, do we need that? You know, what, what, actually is essential. Yeah. I'm sitting on a chair. This is very Western, you know, but what about these, the big thrones? Yeah, do we need big thrones? His Holiness jokes a lot about the big thrones. Yeah, he, he, he jokes a lot <laughs> about several things that have to do with Tibetan culture. And he's actually, he's very uh, clear. He said, uh, you know, in terms of the external things that we do, yeah, he said, fine to adapt it to your culture. And you don't have to wear Tibetan clothes to practice Tibetan Buddhism, I say as I'm wearing this. This is Tibetan version of Indian clothes. Um, and he says, don't try and be a Tibetan because anyway, you're a Westerner and you have a big nose, you won't pass. So he's, he, you know, he's very practical that kind of, that way. Yeah. So he continues here. It's important to differentiate between the essence of the Buddha's teachings for example, the determination to be free from samsara, bodhicitta, and the correct view of reality, and the external forms of Buddhism, such as the color and style of monastic robes, the design of the altar, the type of offerings that are made, and the language and melody of the chants. Hmm? External forms have changed each time Buddhism has spread to a different place. And this does not affect the essence of the Buddha's message. Okay. However, changing the teachings of the Buddha that describe dukkha, here I kept the, the Pali word, for un, or the Sanskrit word, for unsatisfactory experiences. Okay, so the teachings that describe uh, the dukkha, its origin, its cessation, and the path to nirvana, 
If we change those, that would alter the fundamental perspective and principles of the Buddha Dharma, making it no longer the teachings of the Buddha. Oh, so now I'm going to get on a soapbox. And this relates to Buddhism in the future. Okay. What we see in the West happening is because in Asia, uh, in Asian countries, just like in our country, they don't necessarily differ differentiate between culture and religion. It's all mixed in together. Yeah, I mean, like Christianity in this in this country, it's mixed in with Western culture. But do you need to build a, West, a copy of Westminster Abbey in the middle of Africa if Africans become uh, become Christian? You know, that wouldn't look right, would it? You would build something from Af African architecture. Yeah, so the, the same kind of, of idea here. Anyway, so that works for architecture. But what I find is that some people, they have problems. They don't particularly like certain teachings that the Buddha gave. So they develop an attitude. They say we're agnostic and that we don't, will only believe what can be proven. If it can't be proven, we, we don't believe it. So this is nowadays called secular Buddhism. But if I look, yeah, how, you know, how much can we prove? Even in Western culture, uh, us, anybody here a physicist? You know, can any of us prove that atoms and molecules exist? Can you prove that? We can't prove it. We take the, the word of the scientists. We have faith in the scientists. Even though sometimes the scientists, they change their ideas, you know, every year things change. Okay? But there's a lot that we just take, you know, we believe what the experts say. So then, so I'm just doing this about how much can we really prove? Yeah. Can you prove that the Buddha Dharma Sangha exists? You can prove it, but in order to prove it, you have to learn a lot of Buddhist philosophy and reasoning first. Okay? So for most common people, if you can't, you know, they say, we can't prove, how do you know that, that the Buddha exists? If you're a beginner, how do you know? How do you know it's possible to eliminate ignorance? Huh? So when we get down to, I'm only going to believe what I can prove empirically, then actually there's very little we can prove. Yeah. There's very little we can prove, in, in, in just in the world in general. Yeah? There's so much we don't know. So, if these people are saying we're only, they want to modernize Buddhism and get rid of the mythology and everything that they think doesn't make sense. But then, what do you wind up with? If you're agnostic about rebirth, then that totally changes the path, yeah? Because if you don't believe in rebirth, if you believe that at the end of this life there's nothing, then death is the cessation of suffering. It's true cessation. And everybody should die as soon as possible because that will stop their suffering. That's logical, isn't it? Yeah. Who wants to go follow Jim Jones and take and his group and take poison? Okay? 
So what I'm getting at is I think that secular Buddhism, you know, if people want to believe like that, if they want to practice like that, that's fine with me. But please don't call it Buddhism. Call it something else. Yeah? Call it something else. Because, you know, it, it's not, it, it isn't actually, you know, Buddha's teaching, in my view. Okay? Now, some of those people may investigate things and may believe in different things, but some of them may not. So, I don't know. To me, then, yeah? If you take away, if, if you don't understand the mind as something different than the body and the brain, if you don't th consider that the mind has a continued continuity of one moment leading to the next moment, including after we die, that if you don't have that, then how even how you meditate on compassion is going to be very different. Because then you're only going to focus on the suffering, the obvious suffering in this life, and have com compassion for beings who have obvious suffering in this life. Yeah? Because you don't believe in future lives, you don't, you know, all these other things, or you're agnostic about it. But when the Buddha taught about dukkha, he taught about three different kinds. One is the ouch kind of suffering that everybody recognizes as suffering and wants to be free of. The other two, we don't obviously recognize them as suffering. We would not use the English word. Yeah. And we wouldn't think. Yeah. Would you, do, do you, when you hear the words have compassion for the suffering, do you think of wealthy people who have power? Are they included in your compassion? We usually would omit those, pa those people because they don't have obvious suffering. Okay. So, yeah, if you don't, believe in rebirth and you don't see the mind as something different from the brain and so on, then, yeah, there's you only have compassion for people with obvious suffering from, you know, poor health or poverty or whatever. With the way the Buddhists described uh, dukkha, yeah, which is that even when we have what is called happiness, it's still unsatisfactory. Okay? Now think about it. You've had a lot of happiness in your life. Has it been totally satisfactory? So that it met all of your needs forever and ever? Has the happiness that you've had in the past lasted a long time? Okay? If you really think about this, the answers are not yes. Because if they were, you would not be here this evening. Okay? So what the Buddha talks about is that Dukkha has many levels, and what we call happiness is great for the moment it lasts, but it doesn't last very long. And if we keep doing what we enjoyed that gave us happiness, if we keep doing it, eventually it's going to turn into manifest suffering. Okay? So like when you're hungry, yeah, we can have compassion for... What did I do? Um, we can have compassion that are start for people who are hungry. Yeah. But does food give them, solve their problem completely? When you're hungry and you eat, 
Yeah, the suffering of hunger goes down and you're getting full and we call that happiness. But if you kept eating and eating and eating, what happens? Yeah, the happiness you had from eating, you now have a stomach ache. You ate too much. We've all experienced that, haven't we? So then, is happiness really to be found in food? Or is it just a temporary thing that stops the suffering of hunger temporarily? Because if it provided genuine happiness, the more we ate, the happier we should be. And that's not what happens, is it? Okay, so my point here is that if we start simplifying Buddhism so that the Dharma agrees with our ideas and we simplify it so that we don't have to stretch our mind to consider things that maybe haven't seemed obvious to us before, yeah, then it's not going to have the same liberating effect on us. So if we're thinking about Buddhism in the 21st century, we need to think about how to preserve the pure teachings without altering them so that they agree with our ideas. Because then we're changing the path to awakening. If you change the path to awakening, you're going to get a different result. You're not going to get awakening. Okay? So it's something really to think about. Similarly, yeah, it's wonderful now in the West, we share our meditation techniques with uh, people who are not Buddhist. And that's wonderful. Many of the techniques we can, uh, you know, like how to uh, deal with anger, how to uh, overcome self-centeredness. These kinds of teachings can be really shared broadly in society and they benefit people. Okay? But, <laughs> yeah, there's always a but, isn't there? Uh, but, Meditation practice it has to be conjoined with the basis of the teachings that support it. Because according to your worldview, the meditation you learn are going to bring different results. Okay? Let me give you an example. Yeah. I heard a story of, uh, actually I met him one time, a guy who was a rabbi and he wanted to uh, learn meditation. So he went to a Zen monastery and he learned Zen meditation, which was very simple, observing the breath, meditating on the hara, hara, you know, watching the breath, observing the thoughts. He didn't have any background of the Buddhist worldview. He did a Zen retreat, and he came out of the Zen retreat believing, having a firmer belief in God. Now, a belief in God is not part of Buddhism. In fact, the idea of an independent creator who is permanent and unchanging, is antithetical to Buddhist philosophy. So the point is, if you just do some, medit some meditations, we can teach broadly, and they can be done in a secular way. Other meditations, if you teach them without the Buddhist worldview, then people come to the wrong conclusions. Yeah? And is that really helping people? Is that preserving the Dharma? Somebody comes out of a Buddhist 
retreat and says, I really had an experience of God. Yeah, what's the, what's, you know, if that, if people start talking like that, what's going to happen to the Buddhist teachings? Okay, so this is something else we have to be very careful about going in the future to, to really make sure that the Buddha's teachings are taught properly. Yeah. If people want to take certain portions out of the teachings and use them for something else, that's fine, but don't call it Buddhism. So like the, the current mindfulness craze. Yeah, you notice mindfulness is the latest buzzword. Everybody's doing mindfulness. They're teaching it in banks. They're teaching it in corporations. Psychotherapists are using it. It's wonderful. It helps people. But the way they're teaching it is not the way of Buddhist mindfulness, at least not in the four establishments mindfulness. And it's done without the Buddha's context. Yeah. So if, you know, modern mindfulness, wonderful, but it's got to be taught properly. Otherwise, you're going to get somebody who says, you know, if you, if you define mindfulness just as being aware of what you're doing, yeah, if you define it that way and you don't explain it well so that somebody is learning mindfulness from an app, without a teacher, without any explanation, excuse me if I'm offending anybody, it's not meant to criticize you, it's meant to comment on the people who are teaching. If it's te taught like this, yeah, then you could get somebody who's saying, you know, I sat down in the morning to do my mindfulness meditation. I was mindful that I'm angry at one of my colleagues. I'm mindful that I want to retaliate for what that person did. Now I'm going to work. I'm practicing mindfulness. And I'm mindful that I want to criticize that person. And I'm mindful that I want to just get my anger off my chest. And so now I tell that colleague off and I'm mindful of how good I feel after telling that person off. Yeah? Is that Buddha's teachings? Is that something beneficial to that person? Yeah? So it has to be explained properly. Yeah? And like I said, just call it secular mindfulness. Don't call it Buddhism. Yeah. Because it is good and it helps people. But if you call it Buddhism, many people won't go because you call it Buddhism because they're Catholics and Muslims and so on. So just call it secular mindfulness. But at least teach it properly combined with ethical conduct. And that mindfulness is not just being aware of what's going on in your mind. It has to be supported by ethical conduct. Yeah, otherwise it's harmful to that person and to everybody else around them. Yeah, oh, I'm mindful. I'm lifting my hand up, clenching my fist. I'm mindful oh, that I'm slugging you in the face. Oh, very good, great spiritual practice. Huh? Okay. Regarding the development of Buddhist thought in ancient India and in the classical period in Tibet, many of the debates in the text center on issues in epistemology, cognitive processes, and the relationship between body and mind that were important to people at that time and place. In ancient India, Buddhist thinkers had to respond to philosophical claims made by non-Buddhist Indian schools. While some of those debates may, upon first glance, not seem important to us, because you're refuting the Samkhyas 
Yeah, anybody know what a Samkhya believes in? Yeah, you're refuting the Samkhas and the Mimasakas and all these other people. So at first glance, it may look like these debates are not very important to us. If we look closely, we may see that some versions of those thoughts might exist today, like the idea of a permanent creator, okay? Or the idea that there's only material things and anything that you can't see or contact with your senses doesn't exist, you know? That existed in ancient India, that view exists now. In that case, studying their refutations could help us when speaking with our contemporaries who assert the existence of a universal mind, an absolute creator, predetermination, and so forth. Understanding the reasons disproving the theses of non-Buddhists may also help us dispel similar kinds of beliefs that we may have. Okay, here's another area where I think Buddhism can develop as we go along in the future, is uh, now we have to be able to respond to scientists. And His Holiness encourages a lot of dialogue with, with scientists, and he's quite interested in that. But there's some, also some difference in beliefs, and we need to be able to explain what the mind is and explain what rebirth is without just quoting Buddhist scriptures. Yeah, Because scientists, they say, yeah, so what? You quote the Buddha, big deal. I'm not going to believe something because the Buddha said so. You know, I want logic. So we have to have the logical reasonings, you know, to give to the scientists. Yeah, quite important. And then also, uh, there's certain topics, for example, uh, the dip, you know, in West, we've been quite preoccupied with free will and predetermination. You know, centuries of Western philosophers, do we have free will? Is everything predetermined? And remarkably enough, that topic never came up in ancient India or in Tibet. It's not something they ever wondered about. I find that so interesting, you know, the difference in cultures. But as Buddhists, because people are coming and asking us this, we have to be able to respond. Do we believe in, in free will? Do we believe in, uh, in predetermination? Yeah, so we have to be able to respond to these kinds of things. Okay, so there's much more just in this little section, but we're running out of time. We've reached the future, which is the end of the talk. <laughs> and uh, now there's a few minutes for questions and possibly answers. Yes. Uh, you mentioned sec secular Buddhism and it's kind of spread to the West in mindfulness and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the one organization that kind of sprang to mind was the Soka Gakkai International. The what? The Soka Gakkai. It's a Japanese brand of uh, Buddhism. Nichiren Buddhism. Oh, the Soka Gakkai. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so, yeah, and I think they've kind of westernized Buddhist teachings to the point where, you know, there's a lot of young professionals who do it, who smoke, who, you know, eat meat. And, you know, it's it's that thing you mentioned of, um, you know, bending Buddhist teachings to justify that. So I was just wondering what your opinion on them as an organization is, whether they're Buddhist or secular Buddhist. And just wanted an answer to that. Okay. It seems to me that um, there's, there's different kinds of Soka Gakkai. There's different branches of it. And some are... Uh, more true to to uh, the Buddhist teachings, and then others focus more on uh, just chanting in order to uh, get things for, of this life. 
to get wealth, to get a, a better career and things like that. So those kinds of things, they attract many people, but the Buddha never really taught getting, you know, that our spiritual objective should be uh, getting material possessions and reputation and things of this life. He, he, the Buddha taught uh, giving up attachment to those things. Okay. So I don't want to really comment too much on another tradition, um, but more talk about maybe some of the beliefs and, you know, how those beliefs manifest in different traditions. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, my question is about how you view rituals. Um, are this something that can be for, you know, changed when it goes out of um, the Tibetan culture, because mm -hmm. I think that um, it's not only about Westerners who are ready or not to, to um, embrace them, it's also about certain Buddhists who are very strict, and they are the ones who say, if you are not, if you don't respect the ritual, it means you are not actually a, 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 a true Buddhist. So I just want to know what your position is on really? that. Really? There's people who say if you... <laughs> Yeah. If you don't respect the, the yeah, rituals? Yeah, no, I mean, they, they, they like the ritual and they think that, you know, I understand the function of it, but, you know, uh -huh. I wonder to what degree do you have to keep it? Yeah. Okay, rituals are, they're designed to, they're actually guided meditations. If you do them properly, they're guided meditations. Because the text is telling you what what to think about you know think about this and then think about this and think about this and visualize this and then visualize this and this so they're actually guided meditations you have to learn them they're not things that you can sit down and do and understand right off the bat you know, maybe some of them, like, you know, we like to offer flowers and things, you know, people can get into and all. But I think they're really things that require teachings. I know for myself, when I first came into Buddhism, I saw people prostrating to a human being. And I was like... You know, because the religion I grew up in, you never prostrate to a human being. And the culture I grew up in, if you're going to prostrate to anything, it's to your credit card and the refrigerator in your car. That's what we value the most. But a prostrate to another human being who's sitting on some big high seat wearing a funny hat? Yeah, who's then ringing a bell and playing a drum and pouring water over people. Like, huh? Okay, so this is why it's so important to get teachings on the rituals. You know, even prostrating, you know, there's a whole teaching on what to think and what to visualize while you make a prostration. So we need to have this, because if we learn it, then these things make sense to us. If we don't learn it, then they don't make sense. And then what you sometimes have, and I'll probably step on some toes saying this, is you have some places... Okay, let me put it this way. I was teaching uh, in Singapore some years ago. And I was teaching the Chenresi practice, you know, the practice of, of the Buddha of Compassion. And the people there love Chenresi. It's Kuan Yin in Chinese culture. And I was teaching the whole practice using Tibetan chanting because that's how I had learned it. And one day we're sitting there doing it. And all of us are struggling with the Tibetan chanting because none of us speak Tibetan. 
even though there's a translation on the opposite side of the page. And I said, what in the world am I doing chanting Tibetan things with people when none of us know Tibetan language? Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, you know, you hear His Holiness say, we should do our practices in the language that we understand. Yeah. But lots of Westerners, it's kind of, you know, because Tibetan Buddhism is a little bit exotic, you know, we have it hands down. The Zenis, the Theravadas, they aren't exotic. Tibetan Buddhists ex were so exotic, don't you think? High thrones, long horns, short horns, hats, brocade, blessed water, blessed pills, blessed cords. Even a piece of string can be holy. Wow. I need to protect this string so it doesn't break, but it's going to protect me. Yeah? So, you know, if we don't understand, this, this all seems hocus-pocus. Yeah. So in the Abbey where I live, we do everything in English, except one small section of, of one practice. But everything else is in English. So we all understand what we're doing. When we give monastic ordination, we have a rehearsal first, and the ceremony is in English. So people know what to think when they're having the ordination. Yeah. When I got ordained, everything was in Tibetan. I was focusing so hard on keeping this robe up. I was so terrified it was going to fall down in front of everybody. Yeah? So, you know, we need teachings on this kind of thing. Then it makes sense. Then people can really decide, you know, do I like rituals? Is that a form of meditation that appeals to me? Or is there another form of meditation that appeals to me more? And people can then choose. Okay? If it's any hint, I mean, I'm not one who particularly likes rituals, but when I know the meaning of them, that I find them very, very helpful for my practice. Very helpful. Yeah. The Tibetans can chant all day and all night. Unbelievable. If you go to India, yeah, yeah, you've been there? Yeah, they can st start at five in the morning and chant the whole day. <laughs> yeah, take a tea break and a pee pee break. But that's it. You know, and for them, that's their culture, and that's Buddhism, and it works for them. For me, chanting all day and all night doesn't work. A little bit of chanting. If we do a little bit of chanting, and I understand the meaning and how to visualize, it's really helpful to my practice. But all day long, mm -mm. okay? So people are different, cultures are different. We have to adapt things according to our culture. We, these are external things, these are not the meaning of Dharma. Yeah, and we have to, each individual will uh, figure out themselves how much these kinds of things really mean, are meaningful to them. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So what I'm getting at is we have to have a very open mind here. Our mind has to be open to learn the meanings. And we have to have an open mind that different cultures and different individuals within a culture are going to find different practices uh, more or less helpful to them. And that's great that there's a variety like that. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. 
Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, you ended by talking about the free will versus determinism debate. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if you could comment briefly on where the Buddhist philosophy falls along that debate. What? What? The free will versus determinism. Oh, predetermination. Predetermination, sorry. Yeah. And where the Buddhist philosophy falls on that debate. Mm. Buddhist philosophy would say that there's no such thing as total free determination in the sense that I can't choose to speak Chinese right now. I don't have the free will to speak Chinese because I haven't created the cause. So there's not free will in the sense that you can do anything at any particular time because the causes and conditions for it need to be in place. On the other hand, yeah, things are not predetermined. There's no God with a plan. Yeah, there is no plan for the universe existing in somebody else's mind. Things happen due to causes and conditions. They're not predetermined, but, you know, there's multiple causes and multiple conditions that come together that bring a result. Okay? So it's not either of those. It's uh, it's really a doctrine of causality, which I think is so logical and so reasonable. Okay, let's sit for a moment. I call this digestion meditation. So think of something that you heard that you want to take home and practice or, you know, something that will help you in your understanding. This is just very short. And then let's rejoice that we had the evening together to share in thinking about something really useful, that we had the time to think a little bit about compassion, a little bit about wisdom. So to rejoice at the merit or the, the goodness that we created as individuals and as a group. And then to imagine that goodness, that merit, as a light in our heart that we then radiate out into the entire universe together with our aspirations, that due to what we've done, may it contribute to the welfare of all beings and to their eventual awakening. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. <clears throat> may that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay. okay, you're all welcome to visit the Abbey. 
Um, we're in the northwest part of the U.S. We have a lot of material online that may be helpful to complement the excellent teachings that you're receiving at Jamyang Center from the resident Geshe and all the other people who come and teach here. Uh, so, you know, we have videos and audio and written stuff, and you're welcome to, uh, to check it out online. tonight and um, and thank you especially for dedicating so many years working on it so that we can benefit from it for us and so many others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, a few things to mention to all of you. So uh, Venerable Chupton Children is going to be at the British Library tomorrow. Um, I believe it's 7.30. Yeah. And so it is Buddhism in the 21st century. And then teaching again on Saturday, um, I believe 11.30 a.m., also at the British Library, um, maybe approaching the Buddhist home, something. Yeah. Uh, and then in the evening, she's uh, doing a second event here at Jamyang, and we're very much looking forward to that. It will be with Vicky McKenzie, who's sitting there, um, who will interview uh, Venerable Children and their old friends, and and sort of be a chat. We call it a chat with Venerable Children, sort of. <laughs> and uh, and so it'll be you know glimpses into your life and your experience at the Abbey and and all of that. So I'm personally very much looking forward to that. And, um, and of course, there are many other events uh, at Jamyang. Many of you, I think, have experienced. We have a wonderful new resident teacher where our community is unbelievably fortunate. His name is Geshe Tenzin, Geshe Namdak. And he's teaching Monday night. It's an uh, intro to meditation. Tuesday, it's on the mind. And Wednesday is this phenomenal series on wisdom, emptiness. And then he teaches most weekend. He just gives, 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 and gives. Um, and last plug, um, as you know, in London from October 7th for two weeks, there's going to be a lot of um, activities in London and throughout the world uh, around Extension Rebellion. And so there's a number of events that we're um, putting uh, together to kind of support that movement and share, you know, uh, join other faith community in kind of responding to the climate crisis. And so I'm particularly um, happy about us doing that. Tomorrow, Extension Rebellion is coming here at Jamyang. They will give a talk on um, heading towards Extension. If you haven't had an experience with Extension Rebellion, it's a really good introduction into the movement, their values, you know, how, um, uh, their, um, how it's organized and so forth. And then on October 11th and October, which is Friday night and Saturday morning, Andy Wistrish is coming and we'll do a talk and a workshop on um, uh, Bodhisattva activism and Extension Rebellion. And then on, the, on that night, on the 13th, Gishe Lakdor, who's uh, an eminent scholar, long-term translator of His Holiness, and a trustee on the Foundation of Universal Responsibility, will give a talk, and it's labeled Universal Responsibility in the Climate Crisis. So there's lots going on, and so you're invited to, to come to any of those, help spread the word that all of this is happening. And I thank you all for coming tonight and wish you a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.